It is said by the old ones that without human blood, the sun would cease to give life. That sacrifice fuels Ko'aliku, the embodiment of the cosmos. Ko'aliku thrives on death in the struggle of oppositions most perfectly expressed in war. Only through its waging can existence be prolonged. I, Berto Morales, in the midst of war, in the midst of terrible loss and death, have given myself to this dictate of the cosmos. One night, a year ago, I found myself standing in deep woods, a paralytic, unable to step forward. In the dark, the stars blanketed by black clouds, I listened. For what? A sound, any sound, a cricket and dark and longing, a creature scuttling for protective brush, a coyote howling for unseen comfort, to be alive, to hear life. And it came to me, slowly, deeply, the beat of my heart. My heart is full of hatred, inhabited by the black twin. I have cultivated it, fed it as a freezing man might feed a dying fire. Watching for signs of dimming embers, always at the ready to stir them up, to pile on fresh dry wood as I rub my cold hands over the warmth upon which I know life depends. The nine levels of Miklan are to be traversed by the spirits of los muertos. Wandering through each underworld, each deeper than the last, the fleshless made to undergo a series of trials for four years before rest can be earned. The black twin, the red twin, are said to have battled through these levels in order to bring redemption. My curse is that the red twin, love, has bled to death in my soul, and peace has died with it. It is said that only the warrior dying in glorious battle can move directly into the fourth heaven. And so I have dictated myself to this, dedicated myself to this, my only hope of redemption, La Calle Roja, the bloody road. And if this slim hope of salvation is but a chimera, a brutal and faithless dream, I will have lost nothing because there is nothing left to lose in this charred heart. But my heart is not dead, even though all that is hungers for is no longer living. My wife, our child unborn, never to be, my home burned, my heart so heavy with grief that until now I dared not pause to think. It is said that the sorrowful, tired unto death, filled with the courage to find relief at the end of a rope, are led to heaven by Ishtab, the moon, the goddess of the gallows. They find grace in the death angel's lunacy, but I have no rope, and more so, I lack the faith for such valor. The Maya, obsessed with the cosmic end, their calendars and astronomy calculated to predict the apocalypse, trace the movement of the planet Venus. They believe the cosmos is a battlefield, an eternal cycle of violence. They do not seek meaning so much as they seek to live with its movement rather than against it. If it be strife, then to seek peace would be futile, an act of self-delusion. I remembered in that dark wood how hatred had rescued me before, how as a young man I had taken it in hand like a hammer or sickle and killed. Hatred scorched me in half, consuming much of the flesh of my hand while somehow salvaging my soul. I recalled how before as a child hatred had stoked my fury to flame and had hastened my escape. In a moment I burned my captor's house and brought its root down upon his head. I resolved to hate anew to fill the emptiness of my cleaved heart with murder so that a fierce balance might be created, so that I might be able to move, if not forward, then backward. I am to be executed in the morning, a target pinned to my chest, my heart's life extinguished. I go willingly. To this you alone bear witness. This is no confession. It is a telling, an admission that the grit lingering in my mouth is the only taste left of this my last year. It is all I have retained, this vestige of my journey, the ashes of my past, my life, my death, my story. I am Berto Morales. I am the false son of a nameless and blind man. I am war. I took his land through a pretense. I am pestilence. When his heir returned to claim his birthright, I killed him. I am murder. His comrades returned to find me and failing to do so took the life of my wife and child. I was loved. I determined to meet injustice with injustice. I am hatred. I brought war to those who ended my life. I am executioner. 
I am guilty of sins that have no name. I have come to the slaughter uninvited and am determined to give my life freely. It is an empty gift from a man long dead. And this last section, which I will read, um, Beto has um, traced a potential lead um, um, and is about to interrogate uh, this person. And, and that's all you're going to know. The offices of Don Antonio Ortega y Valencia were miserly and cramped. I went in during the day. A young man, poorly dressed and thin, with dirty fingernails and ink-stained hands, looked up sullenly until he saw that I was well-dressed, a businessman. Senor Ortega, I demanded. Don Antonio is resting, his siesta, he said apologetically. And where does he take it? I'm not at liberty to say, he said, his voice growing suspicious. Tell me now, I'll personally see to that he lets me apply the lash when he finds you sent me away. At the home of his mistress, an apartment on El Dorado Street, he said regimen. A woman answered the door, older, a former beauty, now defeated. Leave and don't come back until this evening. She looked at me in surprise, about to ask a question. Mind you, don't say anything to anyone. Keep to your business and don't return till the sun has set, I told her. I didn't have to say anything else. She gathered a thing or two and left. Ortega slept in the small salon, his boots off, and open bottle of tequila on a table to the right of the sofa on which he napped. I kicked over a chair and the old man startled, too surprised to make a move with a small pistol tucked in a holster across his chest. I pointed my gun at him. Throw the pistol to me or I tell you where you lay. The old man complied, no longer surprised, wondering what this was about. You're going to tell me some things, I said to him evenly. He gathered himself together then, even managed to smile and then said calmly, I'll tell you anything you want, young man, anything at all. Slowly he sat up, putting his stocking feet on the floor. It was admirable in its way, his bearing, his demeanor, suggesting that this was not the first time he'd looked into a gun. My pistol, he said, tossing across the floor. The woman? Gone, I said. Yes, of course. Very thoughtful of you not to involve her in this. I moved closer, my gun trained on him. I'm here to avenge my wife and dead child. You sent this plate to my house, and now you'll give me a name and a place. Perhaps you made a mistake, he said. I'm a simple businessman, an old man. I don't send plagues or violence. I buy land, yes? Perhaps at discounts when others have chosen to leave or escape the danger, but a killer? I've come for a name and a place, not for lies and justifications. Tell me what I know, what you know. I'll start by cutting off your fingers. I pulled the machete out from my, with my mutilated hand. Yes, of course, he said, looking at the tequila. I've told you that I'll give you answers. Sit down, sit down. There's no need for dramatics, I assure you. I'm sitting here, an old man. I've got my full attention, my full cooperation. Señor Ortega a su servicio, he said almost cheerfully. A man used to command, a man who was very much like my cousin Julio, difficult to intimidate. Tequila, he asked. I made no motion, and he carefully took the bottle in hand, opening it and pouring the liquor into two glasses. Have some. It'll make the conversation more civil, more productive, yes? It seemed a bizarre tableau, the old man in a coat and tie and stocking feet on a red chenille sofa, a golden wool rug registering the sun's late afternoon light as it crept to the middle of the floor, and he, knowing what must happen, pushing toward me a drink of tequila as if we were two reasonably, two reasonable men about to speak of reasonable things. Yes, business, I said. I don't want your goddamn tequila, my voice becoming unsettled, perhaps quavering with anger and confusion as I stared at the face of power, face of control, the face of an adult, and I, somehow, the child. 